Welcome to Tiger Graph's Graph Gurus, episode number 19 on deep learning. In particular, deep learning implemented by the G-SQL query language on a native parallel graph database. So just a few bookkeeping issues. We are using the Zoom uh, video conferencing system. Um, so all the attendees are muted, but you can talk to us through the chat. So you should see a menu um, with Q&A. So that's for asking uh, questions about the technical content, which we will um, address at the end. But if, um, if you're having an issue with the actual webinar, you can send us a chat message right away and we'll try to address it. Um, so this is being recorded and you will get a link to it uh, hopefully by the end of today. Um, and it'll also include files to show you so that you can reproduce the uh, demonstration example that we'll be doing. I um, want to let you know that, and then you can produce that example with the developer edition, which you can get for free. Um, some of this you can also do on Tiger Graph Cloud, which we invite you to take a look at. So um, you can just see at either tigergraph.com slash developer or slash cloud. So my name is Victor Lee. I'm the director of product management at Tiger Graph. I've been with the company about five years um, and I've um, been folk, my background actually is in graph algorithms and graph data mining. So it's really interesting to do today's presentation, which is in a, in a related area on neural networks and deep learning. Um, joining me to do the, uh, who actually helped develop this example um, is Changren Liu, one of our new solution architects who has a, a PhD in mechanical engineering, but it actually did a lot with the mathematics involved. So he actually um, has a lot of experience with uh, data, excuse me, with um, machine learning. So the outline for our talk today is I'm going to give some background on why graphs and machine learning, why that is a useful and powerful combination. Um, touch on just some very basic things on, on what is deep learning. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Changren where he's going to do a, explain his use case, do a demo, and then walk through in, in closer detail how we implemented that using the G-SQL language. So um, just to make it clear, what we did here was that we actually implemented the neural network within Tiger Graph using the graph as the neural network and implementing the computations of the neural ne network using our graph query language. So graph databases and machine learning. Two very hot topics you hear a lot about. Um, graphs are a powerful way to represent information and to query it. We've gone through lots of examples before, so we're not going to spend a lot of time today talking about why use graph in general, but we will talk about why use graph when you're considering doing some type of learning activity. And, you know, you may be a knowledgeable data scientist who really knows their stuff regarding machine learning, or that may be just a buzzword you hear and you know that some sort of computational magic occurs. Um, so this webinar is appropriate for either party, though um, Chang Run is going to get into some nitty gritty detail, um, but he will sort of also summarize it at a high level to make sure that everybody has some can follow the basic flow. So why graph? One of the reasons why graph has become so popular is because it actually reflects the way that people think. Um, we absorb all sorts of information, observations, things we see, things we read about, and we, we transform that raw information in, in our minds into objects with have different properties and then which relate to one another. So um, scientists have demonstrated that that is actually how we conceive of things, that we use a graph model of, of vertices, of nodes, object nodes, relationship edges, and then properties of, of both those nodes and those relationships. And then we use that to do all our reasoning, all our cognition. So we use that to see similarities, to, I, to classify things, to then make predictions, um, then to make recommendations for what should I do? What, 
Um, so that is why by, by emulating what people do, graph and graph databases really enable uh, a human-like intelligence and a an human-like insight into data. Now, machine learning in particular is, is a particular approach to analyzing data. Um, generally, when you have some known target and trying to model what sort of inputs do I need to get that output? Um, what has it been used for? It's, it's used in so many everyday things we have in our 21st century world. Um, if you have Siri or Alexa or any of those virtual personal assistants, there's, there's multiple areas where machine learning has been applied for the voice recognition to understand just transforming that voice into text to do semantic analysis for not only what are the literal, liter, literal words, but what did the person mean when they said that? That higher level understanding, what was their meaning? What was their intent? And then to for, from all the things that that uh, tool quote knows, how to formulate a response. Um, it's, it's been used for um, even without so-called artificial intelligence and machine learning, there's been route optimization, but doing real-time optimization, making judgments, doing self-driving automobiles, um, that definitely is using machine learning. Facial recognition, airlines are starting to use facial recognition for checking in at the airport. Uh, is also the, the clear system for, you know, doing your security screening at the airport. Um, of the, your, your phone can recognize your face to help you log in. So um, this sort of identification is being used in so many ways. Um, people, uh, art, artificial intelligence systems or machine learning systems can scan, can interpret your x-rays better than human radiologists can. Um, so a lot of things, so many could go on and on. So there are also many, many different techniques, but we can broadly throw them categorize them into two different categories. First is unsupervised learning, where there isn't a known correct answer or target that we're aiming for. We're just looking at the data as it is and seeing what sticks out. What are the patterns in the data? How can I summarize the data? So part of that, thinking about what do we mean by summarizing or patterns? One way is to see natural clusters or partitions? Is the data grouped in some way? What, what things are most similar to one another? On the other hand, are there things that really stick out, the so-called outliers? Um, so there are several techniques that can be used here. Neural networks is one. So you can use neural networks for unsupervised learning. But as we'll see, we can also use them for supervised learning. And, and today's topic is, is deep learning. And deep learning, as we'll see, is, is basically just a uh, multi-layered or more advanced form of neural networks. So the, other than unsupervised learning, we also have supervised learning. And this is where, the, this is the case that you hear about most often, where you are training a system to understand and then predict certain types of events or certain situations. So you need training data, which is basically historical situations where we saw that given these inputs, this was the output. And the more cases you can collect, the richer training data, the better, the smarter system you can create. And the idea is the system is figuring out the hidden pattern. What was it that meant that those inputs should result in that output? Um, it is figuring out the rules, the relationships, the dependencies. So again, there, there are many different techniques. I've listed just a couple of them, but you notice that neural networks shows up here also. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, before I get into that, just make one quick observation about explainable results. And this is another reason why graphs are a great technology to use for any sort of learning artificial intelligence task. It's because graphs can help you to understand the answer. Um, now the technique that we're gonna show you today 
uh, deep learning, interestingly, is not always one of the most explainable technologies in that it, it can give you very good predictive models. But if you look at, if you try to break down why it did that, looking inside the results, it may be difficult to understand. Uh, an advantage of using graphs in general, not for necessarily neural networks, but say for feature extraction, to look for little mini patterns in graphs and call that a feature, such as how many neighbors of a certain type does this node have? How many hops is it to get from this node to another certain type of node? Um, is there reciprocity in the relationships? That, that's what I mean by a little graph pattern um, and usually centered around an individual start point. Those can be used. Those, those type of patterns have semantic meaning. You know, when I talk about what is the shortest path, we understand that. We say, what's the easiest way to get from there to there, either in physical connections or maybe who do I have to talk to? How many people do I have to go through to get from here to there? Um, similar, how many friends do I have? Those are all understandable things. So if you build a machine learning model, which is using those types of features as its base, then when it creates the model and says, these were the prominent features, these are the weights you should use to make your predictive model, then you can point and say, aha, um, that model was pointing to these particular features that how, how many shortest, what's the length of the shortest path? Maybe you need a shortest path that's um, no longer than three hops. Maybe you need to have uh, reciprocal relationships with more than 10 individuals who are themselves related to one another. It's that sort of thing that where an analyst, a human analyst can look at the model and say, ah, I see why it made that prediction. And then perhaps actually, maybe there's some follow-up activity. You know, if this is some sort of investigation, figuring out suspicious or notable cases, then there's some follow-up action to say, um, we need to dig further or some automated action, send out uh, a message, send out an alert, et cetera. So graphs are, again, very useful for machine learning. One way is for unsupervised learning because we have algorithms for that. We have algorithms for frequent pattern detection, for clustering and community detection, for ranking things. A lot of you have heard of PageRank. What is that doing? It's finding the most influential or most authoritative, authoritative entities within a graph. That is a form of unsupervised learning and that can be very useful in itself or it could be useful as a feature to then go into supervised learning. So a second way that graphs are really useful for machine learning, again, is to extract features as I said. I just spoke about that. I'll just lastly mention there's a technique called graph embedding where rather than manually selecting features, you're actually trying to summarize the entire structure of the graph. Actually, from the, from the perspective of each node, looking at its entire neighborhood, layer upon layer, neighbor, neighbors of neighbors of neighbors, and somehow summarizing that as a linear vector. And then so for each node, you have a vector that describes a, a reduced you know, dimensionally reduced description of the entire graph. And then now I've reduced the graph to a matrix or array structure and I can apply traditional machine learning techniques. The third way is what we're gonna talk about today is using the graph directly as a neural network. So as the name suggests, a neural network is a network. It's, it's a set of nodes and connections. And the classic structure is is this three layer structure from left to right, input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. The, the input has the input variables. The output has, for your training data, it's the result that we observed. If you have these inputs, you get that output. And the hidden layer are these extra variables that we use to essentially tune the machine to fit the behavior so that it fits our training data. And in the training process, all of these edges will get assigned some weights so that we see the relative importance of how much does that input affect 
that hidden variable. So there's a weight there. And then in the second stage, there's a weight here that says, how much does that hidden variable affect that output? And so um, through the iterative training process, we figure out these weights. So as we see, a neural network is a graph. So it seems like a perfect fit. So why hasn't this been done before? Well, there are a couple reasons. Um, one, to run a neural network, you don't necessarily need a graph database. A graph database is managing persistent data with a, a lot of administrative features where um, you may not, if you're just doing a one-time analysis, you may not need a graph database. You just need a temporary graph data structure. Um, but if you're already storing your data in a graph database, this is a bonus. This is say, hey, I can keep my data in the graph. I don't need to export it to do my neural network. I can do it right in place. The other challenge is, can you? Because you're going to have to support some moderately complex computational um, activities describing the mathematics of, of this neuron and that neuron. Um, and then that's a lot of edges. There's, you know, um, it, it, it's a lot of work. So what you need to effectively, efficiently do this is you need a graph database that supports massively parallel processing um, and also the performance that you get with a native graph, something that's designed to be a graph and is not a graph layer on top of some other storage model because that just results in inefficiency. So if you have a native parallel graph, then you have the performance you need to run large neural networks in graph. This is my last slide before I um, hand it over to uh, my colleague Changren. Okay, we've talked about neural networks. We were gonna talk about deep learning, right? Um, some of you already know the answer. Deep learning is merely the application or the configuration of a neural network where you have multiple hidden layers like this. Like this one has three hidden layers. And this allows you to have um, multi-level hierarchical identification and training of different interior variables. So using this image recognition example, first it's finding the edges, the so-called uh, lines between different colors in a graph. And then maybe this is looking at more complex combinations of edges. And then this layer is turning those combination of edges into human features, a nose, an eye, a chin, a mouth. Um, so, you know, that, that can be tricky, but so you need, again, significant computational power. And a graph database like TechGraph does have that. Um, and again, we've talked about some of these applications already, so I'm not gonna linger on that. Um, I've spoken enough. I'm going to hand it over now. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hopefully Changran is ready and he's going to take you through our working example. Hello everybody, this is Changran. And first I want to thank uh, Victor for the very insightful introduction of graph and deep learning. So now I'm going to show you how I build a neural network use Tiger Graph. Specifically today, uh, the, I will going to show you the network I built for recognizing handwritten digits. And here is a brief introduction of the problem we want to solve. So in this problem, given an image of a handwritten digit, and in this case, we are actually only going to deal with the 20 by 20 grayscale image. And it looks like this. So basically each image will have 400 pixels and each pixel will be represented by a zero to one value. Now we want to pass this 400 pixel image to our neural network. And then our neural network will spit out 10 values for us. And hopefully these 10 values can tell us how likely this image is going to be the corresponding digit. And in this case, uh, if, because for this, uh, in this case, if we are seeing an image of five, 
then hopefully the number, the value that corresponds to five will be the highest, uh, meaning that this image is most likely to be five. Now, if you have some machine learning background, you will know that before we can get accurate result from our neural network, we need to first train our neural network. So here in this example, I actually get our uh, training data from a free online course provided by Coursera. In this case, altogether, I have 5,000 images. What I did first is to split these 5,000 images into two parts. So for this demo, I will use 4,000 of those images to train my neural network and then use the rest 1,000 images to validate my model and test how good it works. Now that we know what's the problem we want to solve, I will first show you the solution implemented by TigerGraph. So now, and then after that, I will come back for the detail of implementation. Now let me switch to the Graph Studio. And now you can see this is the schema I built for the neural network. So in my schema, I have a input layer, hidden layer, and an output layer. And I will store my training data on the input layer and the label for the data on the output layer. And we will also have edges to connect the nodes on the different layers and the weight will be stored on the edge. I will actually come back for more detail of how we load the data into the graph. But after we load the data into the graph, we can see in my implementation, I have 10 output layer vertices, 26 hidden layer vertices, and altogether 401 input layer vertices. And these are the number for the edges. Now, if I go to explore graph, you actually be able to visualize the neural network. So here I'm actually not showing all of the nodes because there'll be just too many, but you can see the input layer nodes are connecting to the hidden layer and then hidden layer are connecting to the output layer. So now let's come to the queries. So to train the neural network and also test the neural network, in this demo, I have three queries. And in this prediction accuracy query, what I uh, use this for is to test the prediction accuracy of my neural network using the validation data. Now, if I run this query, we will see this is the accuracy I have. So basically uh, here I'm getting uh, about 10.5% accuracy, which is basically uh, the accuracy you will get if you just take a random guess, because in this case, we have 10 different digits. And if you just randomly guess one, and then you will get a one out of 10 digits correctly. And this is be because I haven't trained my neural network yet. Now, if I move to this training query, if I, uh, so this query is to train our neural network. If I run this query, it will first ask me to input the alpha, which is actually the learning rate. I will come back to what it is later. But now if I run it, you will see the cost function on our training data and also the validation data. So if you're not familiar with neural, uh, neural network or machine learning, the cost function is basically describe the difference between our prediction and the real value. The smaller the cost is, the less the difference between the prediction and the real value. So we actually want to train our neural network to minimize this cost. So now I want you to focus on these two number. If I run this training query again, you actually see the cost start to go down. Now, if you keep looking at this number, as I run this query again and again, you see those two values will keep decreasing. Now, let me 
come back to this prediction accuracy query. Uh, just to quick remind, uh, this query tells us the prediction accuracy. Now, since I have already trained my neural network for a couple of times, you see now the prediction accuracy already increased from about 10%, now it's to 24.7%, which is already a big improvement. Now to finish uh, training this neural network, it takes about three minutes and I'm actually not going to train the model live here. So what I'm going to do next is I will just load the already trained model into the, uh, our graph database. And later I will show you more uh, tests on this already trained model. So here I will just load the trained model to the database. And this only take uh, several seconds. Okay, after I loaded the data, let's again try to see what's the accuracy now. So I just run this prediction accuracy query again. Now you will see, all right, we already have 96.2% uh, accuracy, it's very close to 100%. Now to further test this model uh, we just trained, I will actually just draw a number and then import this number into our graph database and let this neural network to tell us what this digit I just draw will be. So here I'm just showing you a online sketchpad. So let me just draw a digit here. I just Let's try two. Okay, let me just save this image. I will be okay, now let me first uh, upload this image to my AWS machine. Okay, done. Okay, now uh, remember our neural network only take a 20 by 20 grayscale image. But actually using this sketch pad, I will have higher resolution than 20 by 20. So actually before I can send this uh, image to the neural network, I will need to first convert the image to a 20 by 20 grayscale image. I will, uh, so here I will use a Python code to do that. So this is Literally the only thing you need to do outside uh, Tiger Graph. Okay, so after I convert the image, I will use this prediction from uh, Sketchpad query to see what's the uh, digit I just drew. Now, so, so here I already put the uh, file path of the data. Okay, now you can see the output will be the digit and its corresponding probability. And we can see for this image I just draw, you see two digit, digit two has the highest probability and it's actually very close to one and it's much higher than the probability of the rest of the number. Okay, now let me come back to the detail of the implementation. So if you have used TyGraph before, you know that before you write query or load the data, you will need to first define the schema for the graph. And for those who of you that are not familiar with TyGraph, a schema is basically to tell the database what types of vertices and edges we have in the graph. And also, before I continue, I just want to say that uh, this is not the 
only way you can define a schema for the neural network problem. And this is just my own version of implementation and you are encouraged to try out other ways. Uh, in my version, I actually have three types of vertices, as I just said. On the uh, input layer vertices, I will store the pixels of our training data and also the validation data. And then on the output layer vertices, I will store the label of a training data and validation data. And I will also actually show more detail of how these data are stored later. And then on the edge between those layers, I will use a variable theta uh, for the weight of the neural network. And lastly, to initialize the neural network, I will just assign a randomly generated weight on each edge. And after we load the graph, this is what the uh, uh, neural network look like. Here is more details. So in the input layer, we will have altogether 401 vertices. And one of them is the bias vertex. We actually don't need to load anything to this vertex. And the other 400 vertices is for our image. And similarly, in the hidden layer, we will also have one bias vertex. And this vertex is not connected to the input layer. And we will also have another 25 vertices. So altogether, 26 vertices in the hidden layer. And lastly, in our output layer, we have 10 vertices. So remember, for each image, our neural net will output 10 values telling the probability of which digit this image is. So those output will be put on the output layer. And here is exactly how we store the data on the graph. As I said, for one image, there is 400 pixels. And those 400 pixels will be stored in the 400 vertices in the input layer. And also, we will store the label of the training data in the output layer. And in this case, uh, since we have an image of one, then we will just have a one on the first node of the output layer and zero for the rest of the nodes in the output layer. And of course, we will have many, many images for training. So the pixels of the second image will be stored in the second entry of the list on each node in the input layer. And again, on the output layer, the, la uh, the label will be stored in a similar fashion. So in this case, because it's an image of zero, so the 10th node in the output layer will have a one and the rest of them will get a zero. So in the end, after we loaded all of our training data, each node will have a list of pixels. And the length of the list will be equal to the number of images we have. So for the X training list and the Y training list, the length will be 4,000 because we are using 4,000 images for our training data. And similarly, for the X validation and the Y validation list, we will have a list with the length of 1,000 because we are using 1,000 images for the validation. Okay, so that's all about uh, how we load the data into the database. Now, before I start to talk about the detail of uh, artificial neural network algorithm, let's first look at uh, biological neuron first. So here I'm not trying to pretend to be an expert in neuroscience, but this is to give you some intuition of how artificial neural network works as its structure is actually inspired by the bio biological neural network. Uh, I'm not going through all the name of the structure of a real neuron, 
but basically what a biological neuron does is it will receive the signals from other neuron it connects to and you will then process those signals and you will signal the neurons that it connects to and the learning uh, the learning of, of our brain involves growing topic specific dendrites to connect specific neurons at a specific synapses. And our artificial neural network at high level actually does almost exactly the same thing. It will also receive signals from other nodes it connects to and then process the signal and then signal to the other nodes. Except that when our brain learns things, we strengthen the connection between neurons and for artificial neural network, it will actually adjust the weight on the edges connecting the nodes. And actually I know that some people may find it intimidating to understand how deep learning works because all of the uh, linear algebra notations, the matrix operations. So today I will talk about uh, deep learning algorithm a little bit differently. So I will visualize all the operation using graph. And personally, I found this uh, easier way to understand the deep learning. And in the end, I hope you will see that neural network is essentially a graph. And the neurons are just the vertices. The synapses are just the edges. And what the learning algorithm does is it just passing information between vertices through edges in the graph. And here I'm showing you the flow chart of the query to train our neural network. So for this query, we'll first take the training data on the input layer and then forward propagate them to the hidden layer and then the output layer. And this is essentially passing signal, signal from one neuron to its connected neurons. And the next step is to compute the difference between the current prediction and the real label value on the output layer vertices, and which is essentially process the signals. And lastly, if we are not happy with our current prediction, we will propagate this difference back to uh, the hidden layer and use this difference to update our weight. And hopefully after the update, we can further reduce the difference between the prediction and real value. So first, I will talk about the, our GSQL code, uh, code for the forward propagation part. I will actually skip the variable declaration part. And also before I start, uh, as you can see, the variable of the code is actually color coded and the color of the variable is, uh, color of the variable on a certain vertex is the same as the color of those vertices. So you can see for the variables of the input layer, it has the same color as the vertex in the input layer. And looking at the code, uh, this select statement will select all the edges connecting the input layer to the hidden layer vertices. And then in this acume block, we will send the product of the hidden layer input and its corresponding weight to the next layer. And here is what it's doing. And you can see the math expression for uh, this block of the script. And one more thing is when we are doing this, we need to check whether this input layer node is a bias node. If it's a bias node, then we just send uh, one, the product of one and the weight to the next layer. So what this function do is it will multiply every element of an array by a constant and then return the new array. 
So after we propagate the signal from the input to the hidden layer, the next thing we do, if you remember, is to process the signal. And we do this by applying an activation function to it. In this example, we will use a sigmoid function as the activation function. And the expression is shown here. And this uh, function does, does uh, the expression here. Again, it will do the operation on every element of the list and then return the new list. And the following step will be very similar to what I just talked about, except now we want to propagate the information from the hidden layer to the output layer. And again, the mass expression is shown here. So in the end, we will have the activation for the output layer. And here to get the activation, we will again apply a sigmoid function to the every node on the output layer. And after we get all of this activation on the output layer, that's our, uh, we're already done with the forward propagation. And those activation A here will just be the, uh, tell us the probability of of which digits this image is going to be. And now, if we are not happy with our current prediction, to adjust our weight according to our current prediction, the next step is to do the back propagation. Here is how it works. And back propagation is basically the forward propagation we just talked about, but in the opposite direction. So in this case, we will actually first start from the output layer and then get the difference between our current prediction and the label. And the next thing is to back propagate this delta from the output layer to the hidden layer. And now after we get a back propagated signal on the hidden layer, similar to forward propagation, we will process them by applying a function to it. And this is the expression for that function. And again, this is done by this block of the code. And lastly, with all the deltas uh, calculated on the hidden layer and the output layer, we will now use them to update our theta. We will do that first by computing the partial derivative of the cost function to the weight. Uh, I know that I haven't formally introduced what a cost function is yet, but uh, since this webinar is mainly to show you how to use telegraph for neural network, so I won't spend a lot of time talking about the detailed concept of machine learning. But again, you can just understand the cost function as a metric to evaluate the accuracy of a prediction. The smaller the cost function you have, the closer your prediction is. And this partial derivative of the co uh, cost function can actually be determined by our input x in the input layer and the delta we just get from our back propagation. And after we get this partial derivative, we will use that to update our theta. And what this equation mean is actually saying that if we know that the increase, our, the increase of our weight will cause a higher cost function, then we just want to decrease the value of our weight. And in this equation, this alpha is the learning rate, and this is basically the step size we want to take to update our theta. Now to the update of the theta between the hidden layer and the output layer will be very similar. We will first compute the partial derivative 
and then use the partial derivative to update those weights. And that's actually all of the code. You can see that actually you only need a few lines of code to train your neural network using tiger graph. Now, before I finish, I actually want to share some idea with you. I know that some of you may ask why we want to use graph database to do deep learning. And here is what I think. So our human brain contains about 100 billion neurons. And so far for the size of artificial neural network is way smaller than our brain. And this may actually explain why our brain can do so much more than artificial neural network. If we really want to build an artificial neural network that has say 100 billion neurons, then the size of the artificial neural network will, ne will not be able to fit into any memory. So at that point, we actually have to use a database to manage the data. And on top of that, the structure of our, our brain is actually more, way more complicated than all the uh, artificial neural network we have. And this will actually uh, becomes very difficult to use a conventional linear algebra method to describe the neural network like this. But this is also not going to be a problem for the graph database. So with that, I would like to conclude uh, my part of the talk and I will be happy to take the questions. Thank you, thank you so much. So um, we are ready for your questions. We've had uh, three, I've, I answered one already online. So um, if you have questions, please um, send them through the, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So first one, there are lots of open source resources, uh, resource libraries for machine learning using traditional methods and neural network is one of those traditional methods. Do we have libraries available for machine learning? Um, let me answer that one. So we currently have a graph algorithm library. So things like page rank, things like community detection, shortest path, we do have built in algorithms available, which are also open source. Just like here, you could see the G SQL that we're using. You can see the G SQL that we're using for those graph algorithms and you can modify it um, to if you need to customize it. Um, we're in the early stages of developing machine learning libraries. Um, right now in the graph algorithm library, we have a K nearest neighbor uh, uh, algorithm, which is often considered a machine learning technique. So um, over time, we will, we will be adding more and more machine learning built in uh, templates or algorithms or libraries available so that you can run them directly in Tiger Graph rather than having to export the data. Um, let's see, is that a, okay, that's a question and answer there. So I, I'll just actually mention, um, there was a question, what, are you aware of any cases where Tiger Graph has been, machine learning has been used to extract certain phrases from text documents such as to analyze contracts. Um, and one of our readers, one of our viewers answered, um, which I think you can all see, I am using Tiger Graph and Keras to extract phrases from contracts. So somebody out there says, yeah, they are doing it with Tiger Graph. Um, next question, are we, are you, I'll see if I can um, let uh, Chung Rai answer this one. As you train the model, where does the training data reside? Where is, where is the training data? There's output as the final result, but there's all the data from the machine learning process. So where is that data? Can you answer that, Chang Ren? Oh, so I think the question is, where do we put our training data? So the first question, yeah, where does the training data quote live? So I think um, when we first import the raw data, where is it? And then as you run the training and have, you know, intermediate computational results, again, where is that data? Yeah, so as I said, uh, 
training data will be stored first loaded into the nodes in the input layer and together also with the validation data. And Do then when we go yeah. back to your slide with yeah, showing yeah. the graph architecture. Okay, here. So if you remember, when we define the schema, we will have a list on each one of those vertex in the input layer. And then those lists, when we load the data or our training data and the validation data, those lists will be populated by the pixel of the image we use for our training. So in the end, each vertex in the input layer will get a list and those lists are the pixel of the training data. And as we run the query to train the model, those data will be uh, propagate to the next layer and then uh, f finally the output layer. So that's uh, overall how this uh, data flow in our graph. Right, so I, I wanna mention that because we are a property graph, these uh, vectors, these fields that we're talking about are properties of the vertices. So they're not an outside data structure, they're actually part of the graph. Um, in some cases, they may be uh, persistent attributes. In other cases, they're what we call accumulators. And accumulators are temporary data structures which exist. They are attached to the graph, but they only exist during the execution of the query. Um, so they're, they're a great way, not just to provide temporary storage, but they also have built-in computational aspects as the name suggests, accumulate. They um, are very efficient for parallel uh, accumulation of temporary results and, and combining them very efficiently. Um, next question I, I will answer. Are there any plans to support GPU-based processing? We are actively looking at that. Um, let's see. Is a replay available of the slides? Yes, we are recording this and you will get a link to the recording uh, hopefully by the end of the day if, or, or by tomorrow. Um, and again, a request, it would be good to build some functions to embed TigerGraph into deep learning um, as an embedded layer. So yes, we are working on making a lot of these available in a library. So um, I said, we've, we've done this demonstration example. We, we're gonna share the code for this that will also be available. Um, and then in the future, look for this available as just a library function that you can, um, with just a few configuration choices, set up a neural network, load data, and run your model without having to do all the uh, original writing that Chung Run did. Let's see, are there any more questions? We're, uh, we still got time. And we want to thank also all the people for attending. This is uh, had very good attendance today. And um, I'll just mention that uh, Chung Run did this demo today. Um, he developed it. Um, it is, some of you may recognize this example. It is based on an example that uh, I believe Andrew Ng developed, um, has used in an online course such as available through Coursera and maybe some other things. I think he's an instructor at Stanford. Um, so, you know, we should, we want to give credit to Mr. Ng for developing this example. Um, he didn't do it on Tiger Graph, but we, we took his generic example and ported it to Tiger Graph. Um, I, last week I did a workshop where I also, I demonstrated each of the three types of machine learning that we have uh, graph algorithms for unsupervised learning, um, this example, and one where we did graph feature extraction and exported the features to do um, machine learning on an external library, traditional library such as you might already have um, using, using Kaggle data and a Kaggle uh, workbook um, to detect fraud, predict which transactions 
um, at a, in a banking situation were fraudulent transactions. Um, I think we have one last question. Um, we've had two very active participants. Thank you, George and Arvind. Um, what was the user response to doing machine learning on, oh, I guess this would be actually a conversation between Arvind and George. So we encourage you two to uh, talk to each other. Um, the, interesting, you know, how, how what was, uh, Arvind mentioned that he is using TigerGraph for uh, text analysis um, for contracts and George was interested in, in how that is turning out. And we would love to hear too. So uh, um, we would love to follow up with, with both of you. And one last question which showed up in chat. Um, can you give a comparison with how the classical way of doing deep learning would be applied with this number recognition process? In other words, what was streamlined by using Tiger Graph? Um, so the question is, did we, how does this differ? How does the in Tiger Graph method differ from a so-called uh, traditional method for deep learning? Could you, could you respond to that? Oh yeah, so actually uh, our current performance is, may not be as good as a uh, traditional method if you just do some matrix operation using all the linear algebra expression. But actually this is because we are now limited by the like some uh, vector library. So- Right, so I think the question uh, may have been about performance, but I think it was also just the methodology. It says mm -hmm. um, the way of doing, how would you compare the way of doing? I see, so for that actually, I will actually think that if you want to just to uh, design a neural network and then from scratch, it's much easier to do that using graph database because here you can just draw your graph however you like. You don't need to think about uh, what's the matrix, what's, how do I do the differential using matrix, such and such. So I think, so to uh, do a prototype of neural network is actually much easier to do that first in the using graph database. Right. And also, as I just said, so uh, I think we are also planning to add some vector library to our uh, database. So after that, uh, we can also, uh, the imp performance will also be improved greatly. Okay. And I'll, I'll, I'll say right now, we're, we're not ready to say we're going to, today we're not a replacement for TensorFlow, but um, I would love to be, as product manager, I would love to be able to offer that in the near future, but not today. Check back tomorrow. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to wrap it up there where we've reached the top of the hour. I want to thank all our attendees. And again, um, can you go to the, the last slide, please? Um, yeah. yeah, so we have our, our next Graph Guru webinar will be on real-time customer 360. Um, I believe that's next Wednesday. Um, we hope uh, you will sign up for that. You can just, again, go to our homepage um, or info.tigraph.com, uh, Graph Gurus 20. And also, uh, we, you can go to our main website and get all sorts of information. You can download the free developer edition you can try out the new uh, Tiger Graph cloud service, with, which has a free tier. So you can use Tiger Graph cloud for free. We have all of our previous uh, Graph Gurus webinars are available. Um, and the scripts, that is the slides and the data files and, and uh, command files for our previous Graph Gurus are available on GitHub. And we are here to answer any of your questions and look for us on social media. Thank you so much. This has been great. I had a great time. Thank you also, Changren. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for everybody.